Welcome to Experts on College. And one of our more popular experts is here once again. His impressive resume includes heading up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to lecturing in psychiatry at Harvard for seven years before moving to Vancouver. Most recently, he's become one of the leaders in the field of biofeedback and neurotherapy, the medical science of adjusting brain waves. And some people have even referred to him as a miracle worker, and those include fellow doctors. Very lucky to have him in Vancouver and answering your questions today. It's Dr. Paul Swingle. And this is It's All in Your Head. Hello, Dr. Swingle. Good morning. I know that children uh, always are a key theme to the program, and mm-hmm. we are going to talk a little bit today about childhood brain injury. Why is it that kids feature so prominently in your shows and in your work? About a third of our client population are children. And the earlier we can correct some of these things like ADD, it's a life-changing event. It's a real tragedy to see a 40-year-old male or female show up in our office. They're depressed and haven't been able to hold down a job. Sometimes they are alcoholic or addicted. Their self-esteem is in the pits. And it turns out that they had ADD or I should say have ADD, but was undiagnosed when they were a kid. This is particularly true of women, by the way. Women are notoriously underdiagnosed as kids because of one form of ADD that's associated with some of our cultural stereotypes about women, and that's a real tragedy. In any event, if we can see the child uh, when they're just starting their academic careers, it can make a huge difference. The topic for today's program, as you know, is traumatic brain injury in kids. We get a lot of kids coming in with diagnosis of ADD, ADHD, ODD, ASD, LD, all of those acronyms, and it turns out that they've missed one, TBI, a traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury mimics a lot of these things in terms of emotional volatility, impulsive defiance, attention problems, certainly, and learning problems. The nice thing about neurotherapy is it doesn't matter what the actual origin of this is, whether it's a genetic learning disorder, genetic ADD, or a function of traumatic brain injury, or experiential. We did a program just last time, if you recall, on emotional trauma in children. Trauma can mimic ADD. If the child is terrorized or having had a traumatic emotional experience, then a lot of their behaviors mimic ADD. They can't pay attention and so forth. Dr. Paul Swingle is on the air. If you have any questions about neurotherapy, biofeedback, and our topic today, childhood brain injury, although we've talked about every single topic under the sun with our phone callers, and you being a registered psychologist uh, have a lot of uh, experience in all sorts of different levels of what we're talking about today. Before we get into the actual meat of childhood brain injury and misdiagnosis and how to treat it and all that stuff, we should talk a little bit about exactly what you do and how you identify issues in the brain and then how you treat them, which is a scientific process called brain mapping, biofeedback, neurotherapy. And I think a lot of people still aren't familiar with uh, exactly what it is and how it works. Yes, it's odd that a treatment modality, treatment method that's been around for the better part of four decades is FDA registered and compliant in the United States is so poorly known in this region. It's a very logical, very straightforward, very scientifically grounded procedure. The first thing we do is an electroencephalograph, an EEG. A lot of folks are familiar with that. If they got a a hit on the head, they go to the hospital, and often they'll do an EEG, which is a functional analysis of the brain. Often they do MRIs, of course, which has a look at the structural aspect of the brain. But the functional aspect of the brain is done with the electroencephalograph, which measures the electrical activity coming from the brain. Now, we have a pretty good idea of what that should look like. And when we see departures from that, then we can identify the areas of the brain that are not functioning efficiently. That's why I don't ask people why they come to see me, as you know. I do an electroencephalograph, and then I sit down and I tell a person why they've come to see me. And we're virtually always uh, on the money with that. Once we identify the areas of inefficiency, then the way they're corrected is referred to as neurotherapy. And there are three general classes of neurotherapy. One is neurofeedback, brainwave biofeedback. We set it up so that when the brain is doing what we want it to do, the person will hear a tone or see something move on the computer screen that's letting them know about an activity they couldn't possibly feel, but they make use of that information and learn how to regulate brain activity. If it's a kid, we set it up so they play a video game. 
And you've seen some of the video games in my uh, in my office. I still don't do well at them, but <laughs> and sometimes it's moving the electric trains around too. I've seen that too. Yes, yeah, so and we have wireless dinosaurs. That the child can make walk across the floor with their brain. Dolphins diving out of the water in the video games that we use and so forth. The second class of treatments are the brain drivers, and my clinic is number one in North America in the development of those procedures. We actually developed a device that's now being used by a lot of neurotherapists around the country. There we set it up so that we measure a particular aspect of brain function, and based on that measurement, we stimulate with various forms of stimuli, like light, sound, microamperage stimulation, EMF fields, and so forth, to nudge the brain into more normative functioning. The real advantage of that is it doesn't have to be volitional. The child doesn't have to really be paying attention. So we can deal with severe autistic children, traumatically brain injured kids, and so forth, so that we can start to correct some of the brain activity, even though they're not able to pay attention. And then when they are able to pay attention, then they play the video games and so forth. The use of these kinds of procedures then normalizes brain function, and the good news is once it's fixed, it's fixed. Well, that's the, I think that's the key, and uh, medication, of course, is not involved. The first time I met Dr. Swingle, I met him as a client of our radio station, and uh, you did a brain map on me and went through all these symptoms that were you know, bullseye, 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 and bottom line is it, it all came back to my brutal lack of sleep, which was an issue that I had uh, for quite some time. You fixed it, and there's so many dramatic examples Examples of how your patients have benefited from the procedures. In fact, we're going to play you something in just a few moments. Our topic is childhood brain injury, but you had an adult that had a brain injury, and we're going to play the before and after when she first came to the clinic, and then I guess it was what a few weeks, months later that uh, she phoned in and left a message, and you kept those recordings. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we have a, a whole show full of examples today of children, adults, great examples of how much you can change lives with this procedure without any use of medication. And like you said, once it's fixed, it's fixed forever. That's right. Till you get to be my age, then you have to come in three or four times a year to keep the brain sharp. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to play that call for you in just a moment. And uh, Dr. Swingle is uh, downtown on Melville Street in Vancouver. The telephone number at the clinic is 608-0444. That's 608-0444. I know that's a lot of numbers, so I'll just give you the website. That's always the easiest way to look. www.swingleandassociates.com. And Swingle is spelled swing, L-E, S-W-I-N-G-L-E, www.swingleandassociates.com. We're going to have that phone call for you, plus uh, more great examples of how neurotherapy and biofeedback and the brain driver mechanisms can help you or someone you love. And uh, we're going to talk, of course, about childhood brain injury. Is it true that babies can actually be more resistant to bumps on the head? We'll find that out in just a moment. You're listening to It's All in Your Head with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates in Vancouver, www.swingleandassociates.com. Interesting article on your website that you wrote about childhood brain injury and you alluded to all those misdiagnoses that kids constantly get but you have actually a bunch of other website addresses of people who have written about the benefits of your work and how it's changed their lives yes the article that i wrote is on childhood traumatic brain injury and how it's confused with other conditions like add adhd and so forth as you mentioned that's on my website. It's also on 2020parenting.com. A woman who was a patient of mine when I was at Harvard Medical School, who actually is a psychologist herself, and I treated her for traumatic brain injury. She has a book describing her experiences, and her website is drdiane, all one word, dot com. Another interesting book is one published by the mother of a autistic and uh, epileptic child that I treated. She was told by the standard conventional treaters that there was no hope and a very brave woman. She would not accept that. And her son just graduated from high school last year. I think it was this spring, actually, and pictures of him hanging out with all of his friends and so forth. But in any event, she wrote a book called gettingadamback.com is the website. And if you go there, you can see a picture of Adam and uh, you can actually download the book, I believe. So lots of examples of how neurotherapy and biofeedback can help you. 
You had a patient quite some time ago. Her name was Karen. And mm-hmm. didn't she come in with a brain injury, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, it was a brain injury. And this was the time when we had a answering machine on. So I have a call from her recorded. I think it was the first session after we did the brain assessment to see what areas were problematic. And then she called back with roughly the same message. She was changing an appointment 11 treatments later. I think we can play that now so folks can get an idea of how dramatic the change is. So this is the first call after one session. Now, the listener should pay particular attention to the quality of the voice. That's the major change that took place in the early treatment. Dr. Swingles, I'm not going to be able to make a 9 o'clock appointment. We're still digging out the appearance garotin. Um, uh, I'll call you back and make an appointment for next week. Bye. Okay, so that's the first one. Right. Now here's the 11 sessions later phone call. Dr. Swingle, I'm calling to make an appointment for next week, um, Thursday at 11 o'clock. If that's not good, could you give me a call back and let me know which would be a good time? Thank you. That's quite dramatic, and that's uh, after only 11 sessions at the clinic. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what caused the brain? Was it a car accident, or uh, I can't remember how the injury occurred? Yes, there was an accident on the right side of the brain, but where the brain is hit, by the way, is not important in a sense because the way the brain sits in the cranial vault, you're always going to have damage to the front part of the brain. That's why a lot of people with brain injury and kids in particular, you have a severe impulse control problem and also a lot of defiance and a lot of mood problems. And then that's because of the right prefrontal cortex has been damaged no matter where the brain has been hit. Terrific example of what exactly it is that you do through neurotherapy biofeedback. Let's take a phone call. Hello, Doreen. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle, and this is It's All in Your Head. Oh, hi. Thank you for taking my call. I've fallen from quite height when I was a child, about six, seven years of age. And also, I was in an accident when I was in my middle 20s with a severe head injury. I mean, I'm functioning, but I was just wondering, can I get any, um, uh, how can I explain it? I'm not sure what I want to know, but it's, I know that I'm very moody. I'm up and down. I've changed from, from one thing to another within seconds type of thing. I can't concentrate properly and on and on. I don't know if he, he can sort of explain to me. Sure. Do you have some of the characteristic consequences of traumatic brain injury, sleep dysfunction, lack of stamina, poor memory, poor concentration, distractibility, irritability, impulsivity, difficulty dealing with change. Does that sound like you? Yep. Is there is there any hope for me? One of the nice things about what's happened in our treatment and understanding of traumatic brain injury is what we were taught in medical and graduate school when I went to school is just wrong. The fact of the matter is we can treat and get significant improvement improvements a long time after the actual accident. Some of the first things that people notice are changes in mood and impulsivity. Those are the first things that you normally see, unless there's something like voice quality, which you just heard in the last recording. Voice quality tends to clear up as one of the first things that happens, and then mood, then impulsivity. It tends to be in that order, and then we get into the motor functions. So there's absolutely hope for you, uh, Doreen. Uh, We've heard uh, example after example of uh, this very thing. If you need more information, you just visit his website, www.swingleandassociates.com. You'll notice a difference probably after the first two sessions. Is that what a lot of patients tell you, that after the first couple sessions, they just feel or notice differences? That's right. They tend to notice differences after the first few sessions. It's not over then, don't misunderstand me, but people will know they're on the right track. And then it's just a matter of committing and then uh, wrapping up the treatments, and then before you know it, it's fixed, and it's fixed for good. Thank you for your call, Doreen. Great example of what we're talking about. Now, I alluded to the fact that we used to think that because uh, a baby was so elastic, so pliable, you know, they could recover. I mean, these these creatures are are made to withstand bumps and bruises and whatnot, but uh, in the research that you've just uncovered, that's not the case, is it? Not at all. That comes, I think think from folks like myself who are in part of the Dr. Spock era in which we thought that injuries at a young age, the brain was more plastic and recovery was faster and more complete and so forth. The evidence that's come in recently from University of Melbourne in Melbourne, Australia, Dr. Anderson and Katrapopa, I always mispronounce that, they studied children who had injuries from birth up through 12 years of age, and what they found was quite startling. 
they found that there was a clear relationship between severity of injury and the effects, of course. But the other thing that they found, and this I think was really interesting, is that the age of injury was very important. And kids up to about three years of age with moderate traumatic brain injury showed much poorer outcomes than did older children with injury of similar severity. So what we were told when I went to school is just wrong. It's very similar to my response to Doreen's question in which people who are many years post-injury figure that's it. The recovery I have is all I'm ever going to get. That's just wrong. And we can do some very dramatic things in terms of neurotherapy and correcting some of these things. So if your child has had a number of minor bumps in infancy up to, say, three years of age, and then he has another minor bump and he has this major change in personality or major change in concentration, sleep, and so forth, brain injury can be cumulative. And what has happened there is you've gone over some threshold. So it's not a personality issue, it's not a genetic issue, it's not ADD, and so forth and so on. It is a cumulative effect of brain injury, and we can do a lot to help to correct some of those things. Dr. Paul Swingle on It's All in Your Head. What we're going to talk about next is distinguishing between childhood brain injury and all those other symptoms we talked about, ADHD, ADD, LD, and if you have a child who you think may be struggling with one of those things, uh, let's find out whether it is indeed ADD. Well, we can't can't find out for sure, but uh, certainly we could talk about uh, whether or not it might have been a childhood brain injury coming up shortly as we continue with Dr. Paul Swingle. Before we get to just distinguishing between the, I guess, diagnoses here, Dr. Swingle is having a public lecture and a workshop coming up. And these fill up very quickly, and uh, I'm guessing that this will fill up even more quickly uh, because you're going to have live demonstrations and you're going to have people there actually doing some brain mapping on uh, on potential patients. The uh, date is the 22nd of October, that's a Sunday, and it'll be at the Britannia Community Center on Napier Street. Space is limited though, so I'm going to give you a number to call. It's 604-718-5800. That's 604-718-5800. You're going to be talking about uh, ADD, learning disorders, autism, mood disorders, seizure disorders, and uh, our subject today, traumatic brain injury, all very treatable by Dr. Swingle and his associates uh, on Melville Street. So if you want to be there and see how it works in person, maybe even have uh, some brain mapping done on yourself, it's fascinating when you have it done and when you uh, you are told what inefficiencies you may have in your brain and you go, yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's right. That's me. Get your phone call and uh, get registered quickly at 718-5800. One third of your patients are children. How often are they misdiagnosed by the medical profession as having something like ADD compared to perhaps a childhood brain injury? I find it's quite common. Now, ADD and ADHD are wastebasket diagnosis. Anytime a child is having any difficulty, they drop them in that basket and then they start medicating and then they start the roulette system. Try a little of this, see if things are better. Try a little more of this, see if things are better. Let's switch over and add this. Let's add a little more of this and so forth. Often they reach sedating levels so that the child does calm down because you're sedating the behavior. This is a little off topic, but one of my major issues is medicating normal children's behavior. Children are supposed to be boisterous, defiant, and all of that sort of thing, and uh, controlling that and molding that is called parenting. You don't medicate the child so that you don't have that problem. However, getting back to <laughs> getting back to the other reason. I don't think there's a lot of people that would disagree with you, though. I mean, that's absolutely true. I think you'd be surprised. I think you'd be surprised. We've got a lot of parents who would rather drop a pill than uh, take the effort. However, we have a lot of kids come in with other kinds of conditions. They come in with conditions of having been traumatized. Now, it may be family abuse kind of situation, severe family conflict, or being bullied in school. That's very common. If the child is in fear or has a trauma history, then of course they're going to have problems concentrating and staying on task and so forth. Their motivation levels are going to be down. They lose interest and so forth. I see a lot of kids who are medicated for that condition. The other prominent condition is traumatic brain injury. 
And here we have a situation in which the child has areas of inefficiency in the brain, which may mimic, it may actually look like ADD, but it's a function of brain injury. Now, brain injury takes a bit longer, obviously, to correct because you're essentially trying to rewire areas of the brain. By the way, that's one of the things that happens when you do neurotherapy. You get increased dendritic growth, increased blood proliferation, and so forth, and the establishment of what are called new pathways in the brain so that the brain recovers function. Whenever we see that kind of thing, the first thing we want to do is get the kid off medication. And as I think we were talking about the last broadcast, there's been a fourfold increase in the use of antipsychotic medication with kids, Respiridol and that sort of thing. The whole concept of that is very hard to get your head around, you know, giving antipsychotics to kid to control a behavior issue. But in any event, get the child off all of that stuff and get the child engaged in an interesting activity in which the child's brain is going to reconfigure itself basically and correct the problem once and for all. And then we help parents with nutritional issues and I can go over some of the things that we recommend that they add to the child's diet, specific kinds of games, card games, search games, the kinds of things that you play in a car when you're driving on a long trip to try to keep, uh, you know, IC kind of games. What that's forcing the child to do is retain something, be vigilant. And if you can have a sequencing game like a card game in which the child has to remember a few things, then you're building in planning, organizing, sequencing, and following through on things. I mean, that's what you're trying to do with the child. So there are lots of ways we can help a kid without medicating them and sedating them. Well, and especially if they're not medicating the right issue in the first place, which mm -hmm. you see a lot of. And didn't you have some uh, stats about shocking statistics about uh, death caused by <laughs> mis mismedicating or medicating the wrong way? Let's see, where is that? Here it is. A million and a half people killed in the United States. And the error rate in hospitals with regard to medication is, this was reported in the New York Times, by the way, that hospitalized patients should expect to suffer one every day they are hospitalized. Of mismedicating. A medicating error. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Dr. Paul Swingle is here. It's all in your head. The topic is to children today and childhood brain injuries. If your child has exhibited symptoms of ADD or ADHD or has been even diagnosed that way, we'd love to hear from you to find out if, in fact, uh, it may be something else. More on childhood brain injury and more on what exactly neurotherapy and biofeedback is and how it works when we continue with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle & Associates on Experts on Call, and this is It's All in Your Head. Dr. Paul Swingle, who used to head up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to lecturing in psychiatry at Harvard for seven years before moving to Vancouver, and now one of the leaders in the field of biofeedback and neurotherapy, the medical science of adjusting brain waves. And this is It's All in Your Head. And just before we get to uh, Betty on hold here, the last time we were on the air, we actually were on the air on World Cup Sunday. Yes. And we actually missed the first part of it, but, you know, it was worth it. It was really <laughs> worth it. And now I didn't hear this. The secret weapon of the world champion Italian soccer team was? Neurotherapy. A friend of mine in Montreal treated every member of the team. And it was written up, a lot of listeners probably read it. It was written up in the Gazette, the Globe and Mail, and there was a little blurb in the Vancouver Sun about it. It was represented as their secret weapon. The secret weapon was neurotherapy. Well, you have athletes and artists, too, that uh, that do come in to sharpen and that kind of stuff? Oh, yes, absolutely. The clinic is on Melville Street in Vancouver. The number is 604-608-0444. That's 608-0444. And Dr. Swingle's website is www.swingleandassociates.com. Again, Swingle is spelled swing L-E. That's S-W-I-N-G-L-E. Off to the phone board. Hello, Betty. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head on CFUN. Hi there. Um, you've tweaked my interest a little here. Uh, I have a son that's uh, 19 now. When he was three, he had a fall from about 12 feet, had a depressed skull fracture, was on Dunlantin for about a year to prevent any seizures. When he's about 
15. He was having some behavior problems in school, and he was uh, diagnosed with like a, a very mild form of ADD, they said, but they weren't sure. They said that the amount of his disabilities wasn't warranting any further research or testing, and I'm just wondering if this type of therapy would be something we should look into. I would definitely think so. My guess is that it was a legacy of the traumatic brain injury, and he might have had a further injury playing sports and so forth. Several things I would recommend. The first thing is I would recommend you go to another website in addition to my own, of course, but the other one is 2020parenting.com. Mm -hmm. This is the mother of a child who had traumatic brain injury as a child, got into drugs. The child is now dead. The mother is trying to distribute information so that parents are aware of these problems associated with traumatic brain injury of young kids. I think that can be very helpful to have a look at that. The other aspect of this is that the changes in behavior that you're commenting on would definitely suggest uh, traumatic brain injury. I don't think I've ever believed in my heart that he has ADD because I did notice some changes that maybe nobody else would notice because he was two, three and into everything. You know, this child was one that could sit and play by himself for two hours. Yes. And to diagnose him with that, I thought it was a little strong. He moves around a lot. Yes. Like his mind, inside his mind, he moves around a lot. That's his um, analogy of it, you know, that he feels like he's jumping from one thing to another in his brain. There are several possibilities here. From what you described, I would expect to find some evidence of traumatic brain injury. The other thing is I would expect to find some other conditions that are not associated with the brain injury that are exacerbating or being synergic in a negative sense with the traumatic brain injury. One is I would suspect that there's a deficiency of slow frequency in the back of the brain. The best metaphor for that is you can't find peace in your own head. There's too much chatter going on. So it's yeah. hard to concentrate because you're thinking of 30 things at the same time. Poor stress tolerance, predisposition to anxiety, often sleep quality problems. And the big risk here is self-medicating behavior. The mm -hmm. other thing that I would expect to find is a excess of a particular waveform up in the front part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. That affects ability to plan, organize, and sequence. But that can also be the legacy of the traumatic brain injury. How old is your son now, Betty? He's 19. 19 years old. Do you think he'd be willing to, to try something? Like, does he, does he mention? Uh... Oh, yes. You see, I've never ever wanted to put him on any kind of medication. He, he's an actor. He's a budding actor. And um, so that's kind of a uh, scenario around him for, for a long time. Of course, I think that maybe makes, builds on it, right? He's definitely interested in doing something like this and checking into it. Well, you can tell him that we treat a lot of actors. There's a woman in New York City who specializes in Broadway actors and opera and so forth for optimal performance, and it's a neurotherapeutic treatment. So if we can't fix his brain injury, we'll make him a better actor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for calling, Betty. Really appreciate it. Here's uh, Dr. Swingle's number to make an appointment at the clinic. It's 608-0444, 608-0444. Again, the uh, client will come in. You'll uh, do an EEG and then you'll be able to actually look and tell him what the issues may be and uh and that's kind of how the process starts and that's always a, you know you're mentioning the uh, noisy mind and yes. that that was very much my issue you get to bed at night and all of a sudden you're thinking about this and oh what if this happens and then oh I can't forget to do that and before you know it it's 2 in the morning and you're still lying there with your wide, eyes wide open yeah you can't find the switch yeah we've had great calls supporting the subject today childhood brain injury which often gets misdiagnosed down the road, and there is still hope to have it corrected, even if it's years and years after the fact. just want to remind you once again about the public lecture and workshop coming up on the 22nd of October, where we deal with all these uh, types of issues, and there's so many of them. But uh, they do fill up very quickly, and in this particular uh, workshop, there's going to be live demonstrations of brain mapping and brainwave biofeedback, and we'll talk uh, about neurotherapy and brainwave biofeedback treatment for many of the uh, symptoms that you've talked about today. We continue with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head as uh, Dr. Swingle makes his monthly check-in to help you with any kind of brain problems you may have. Joan, thanks for waiting. Joan, you're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head. I was wondering, my daughter was uh, diagnosed with uh, short-term memory problems um, years ago, which I never really did agree with. I know they put her through a series of tests 
I guess the reason I didn't agree with it is at the time Michael Jackson was a big thing with the kids and she would listen to Michael Jackson's song a couple of times and sing it back to me. I guess my question is how do you determine that? And there, can you help it, I guess, is the other question. What brought her in in the first place to get the diagnosis? Her teacher. That and she just said she had trouble concentrating. Well, you know, I don't know a kid who didn't, <laughs> frankly. With some forms of ADD, you can get what's called hyperfocus. And these are the kids that can spend hour upon hour on a particular area that's of interest to them. With kids, sometimes they memorize sports statistics for their favorite sport hero, and they can recite things for hours, but you put them in another environment and they can't find the switch to stay focused. They need to be motivated. Is that the issue? Or? No. If it is truly ADD, there's an area of the brain that's not functioning efficiently, and that can be corrected. For example, one common form of ADD is characterized by an excessive amount of slow frequency activity in a particular area of the brain that makes it difficult for the child to sustain focus unless there's something inherently extremely interesting. Now that same area, if the amplitude of that slow waveform is even greater, that's when you get the uh, hyperactivity because the brain is hypoactive and the child is self-stimming by bouncing around. If you correct that, you correct a lot of problems. Now, the other issue associated with something like short-term memory, short-term memory is usually associated with a deficiency of what's called alpha frequency in a particular area of the brain, which is the mechanism of short-term memory or the working memory registers. If that's deficient, and that can be deficient for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is trauma, then the short-term memory is not efficient. So there are a lot of different things that can be contributing to this problem, and that's why the brain map is such an exquisite diagnostic tool, because it tells you precisely what the problem is and precisely where to go to fix it. And I can tell you, Joan, if your daughter goes in, there's no pain. You just basically go through, I don't know, six minutes, or you read a little bit, you close your eyes, and it's actually very relaxing, the whole process. And uh, Dr. Swingle, he's a very relaxing kind of guy, so it's a great environment. And, and you immediately, after being told what the problem is, you instantly feel better because you feel as though, well, this can be fixed, and I don't have to take any drugs. So I'm going to pass along his clinic telephone number, Joan, at 608-0444. That's 608-0444. As we switch now to Helen, who's been waiting patiently online. Thanks for waiting, Helen. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. Yes, thank you. Dr. Swingle? Yes. I have a, another problem for my son, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he's uh, been having a lot of trouble in the past, and uh, he's bipolar, and he doesn't want to do nothing. He doesn't want to live in no more. Is there any help? He can come in to see you another time, maybe? Or Helen, how old? Years old. Uh, how, how old, sorry? 40. 40 years old. Do you think he's willing to go and try well, it out? Well, I'll try. I got your number, and I can come and make an appointment, maybe, and we can talk to him or whatever. Sure. We Is see it possible? It. Oh, yes. We see a lot of folks. I'm feeling very bad myself. In fact, me to see him like that you know what i mean doesn't all, have no hope in life for nothing to do yes all disorders are family disorders so if one person is depressed for example it affects everybody in the family if a child has add it affects everybody in the family and so forth a person who has bipolar, bipolar is a form of depression in which the individual can get into very very low depressed mood states or occasionally they go into what's called manic phases in which they act impulsively. Poor motivation is almost always associated with depression. You just have no interest in doing anything, which by the way is one of the treatments. We force people to get out and do something to counteract that. We treat a lot of bipolar as we treat other forms of depression at all ages. So Certainly, I would recommend that you come in and have an assessment, and we'll see what we're dealing with. Is depression, bipolar disorder, are you born with those? Can you inherit those? Are they strictly environmental? It's a little of both. Usually, the depression markers are genetic, and there are a number of them. Just like ADD, ADD is not a single disorder. There are a lot of different things that will affect the child's ability to concentrate. Depression, likewise, there are many different forms of depression. Each one is characterized by a different brain activity. That's why, again, it's such a precise measure. You know what kind of depression you're dealing with and where to go to fix it. 
there are some depressions that are associated with environmental or experience. For example, if a loved one dies, you're going to be depressed. It's referred to as grievance. We usually don't do anything with regard to that other than provide some support for the person. I would strongly advise against any antidepressant medication if you're dealing with normal grievance because you will not go through the grievance process and that will give rise to far more problems than allowing yourself to feel. We have exactly the same thing in neurotherapy. If it looks like we're dealing with a normal processing of sad material, then we should encourage that to take place. Now, we can facilitate it to some extent, but we don't wipe it out. Joe, thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. Hey, how's it going? Good. All right. Um, I had a bike accident, like a pedal bike, when I was pretty young, going down a hill and got the high-speed wobble and wiped out into a curb. I got stitches across the forehead. Anyhow, I'm a little older now, but currently, I have a tough time remembering things. Even, you know, things I do two days ago, especially like discussions with my wife. She takes a little bit of time explaining her side of things <laughs> or what she's trying to explain. And I might think of something I want to say, but by the time she lets me talk, I've forgotten what it was I wanted to say. <laughs> it's no laughing matter, but it's a funny scenario. Oh, well, it's a funny scenario. It's the best way to kind of describe how I feel sometimes. I, I just have a, a real tough time trying to remember things. Okay, there are several things going on here. One is you probably have a legacy associated with the head injury that affects your ability to recall. The other thing I would bet on is that you have a deficiency in the back of the brain and in the front of the brain that interrupts your ability to quiet the brain and keep things in sequence. So when somebody's talking to you and not speaking rapidly enough, you're thinking of 12 things and anticipating what you're going to say to uh, that person. That sounds about right. Okay, the treatment of this is very straightforward and it's very likely that you have a combination of genetic predispositions to things and some legacy associated with a traumatic brain injury. That combination is probably what's giving rise to the issue that you're discussing here. Mm -hmm. And this is something you can look at? And... Oh yes, we do a brain assessment and tell you precisely where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. But it's always amazing when you get told what the issue is uh, without even having to say it yourself. And that's uh, what brain mapping is. And uh, that's the beginning of the road to recovery, I guess, if you will. And that's almost the uh, beginning to the end of this program, too. Our subject today, childhood brain injury. We thank you for your phone calls. Uh, we've had a lot of calls actually on that particular issue. It makes you think that it's happened to a lot of different people. Next time around, uh, when you're back on the 17th of September, it's ADHD and related type issues, which is seemingly very common. Why is it that there seems to be more diagnosis of ADHD? You mentioned the wastebasket theory, but is there something in our environment, in our food, something that we're eating that's making kids squirrely or not paying attention? No, I think we become intolerant. I think that's what it is. We want kids to be quiet. We want them to sit there. We don't want them to be boisterous. So we're medicating normal kids' behavior. That's my honest feeling about it. Now, with regard to things like autism, I do feel that the way we have polluted the environment is a significant contributor to the rather rapid increase in the number of autistic kids that we see. The same may be true with ADD. We may be affecting the same kind of brain regions with all of the uh, heavy metal pollution. There's our theme song. That means let's move on, boys. Thank you, Dr. Swingle. We'll see you on the 17th of September. Okay. And again, the number at the clinic, 608-0444, 608-044. We'll see you again on the 17th. Thanks for listening to Experts on Call.